In the current climate, can President Trump pardon himself before he leaves office? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Delaney Marsco, and I am legal counsel for ethics at the Campaign Legal Center. And I am here with Kedrick Payne, who is the general counsel and the senior director of ethics at Campaign Legal Center. And in these unprecedented times, we want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the government ethics space and what reforms we hope to see with the new administration coming in this year. Um, and I think with everything that's going on right now, a big question that's on everyone's minds is about pardons and specifically about whether or not the president can pardon himself. Well, my, my first thought is that people are so focused on the fact that the president may pardon himself that they're missing all the other pardons that may happen, right? The question that always comes up is, is it legal for the president to do a self-pardon? Well, it really doesn't matter whether it's legal or not because he can try it anyway. And there's really no downside to him uh, trying to pardon himself. And there's precedent from governors uh, issuing self-pardons. And at the most means that the president can delay any prosecution because that legal question would have to be answered as to whether his self-pardon is valid. So I just think that the overall question is much bigger uh, than whether the uh, president can, can give the pardons because you have all those unexpected pardons. And then that, that brings me to a question about other pardons that people have seen to overlook. Uh, what is your thought of the pardons that were issued just a little while ago for former Congressman uh, Duncan Hunter and Chris Collins? You know, especially with the, the hurdles that we have in this country for prosecuting uh, corrupt public officials, the pardons, especially of, you know, Duncan Hunter and Chris Collins really throw an additional wrench into that, uh, the whole accountability piece of, of um, corrupt politicians and holding them accountable. And prior to the pardons, um, Duncan Hunter and Chris Collins were textbook examples of effective prosecution of corrupt politicians. Uh, for those that don't know, Congressman Collins had engaged in insider trading and Congressman Hunter uh, essentially stole money from his campaign for his own personal use. And I think the best way to understand the significance of these pardons is to look at other failed prosecutions of high profile corrupt politicians over the past 10 or so years. Um, you know, we had Senator Ted Stevens in 2009, uh, Senator John Edwards in 2012, and of course, you know, famously Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell in 2016. Um, and you know, I think the trend was that DOJ was kind of unable to bring successful cases against these corrupt politicians. And then the convictions of Colin, Collins and Hunter really flipped the script on that. And the weaknesses of those prior cases were, were avoided and the clear convictions were the result. But now that we have these pardons, um, you know, it kind of establishes once again that the very hard work of holding corrupt officials accountable with criminal pros prosecution can be um, nearly impossible. And it, it results in, in less accountability for those who um, undermine our democracy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, think, I think that's a very good point uh, that you see the limitations of the criminal prosecutions. And I think that really points to the need for more ethics enforcement on the congressional ethics side. I mean, prior to the Trump administration and prior to the almost weekly situations of ethics violations coming out of the executive branch, there used to be focus on congressional ethics. I think now is the time that probably is going to come uh, back. And I think that uh, everyone should be on high alert uh, that uh, the ethics in the um, houses of Congress will be a, um, a priority or at least in focus once again. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think, you know, I think there will be a renewed focus on, on congressional ethics. And I think that is is so critical. And I also think that's not to say that the executive branch, you know, also shouldn't be closely observed moving forward, you know, corruption, um, particularly related to the outside's influence of wealthy special interests and in government decision making is not something that's new to the Trump administration. Um, you know, President Trump and, and his political appointees 
sort of just opened new doors to types of corruption that maybe the public and watchdogs uh, didn't really know they had to be on the lookout for. And, you know, I think talking about kind of the, the balance between congressional ethics reform and executive branch ethics reform, I guess one thing to think about is, is what is the role of Congress in, in these reforms? Like, what are they going to do and, and what is it going to look like? Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's one of those situations uh, that you, you think about when uh, they say, uh, when a dog chases a car, it chases the car and it barks at the car, but what is the dog gonna do once it actually catches the car? So now you have a Congress that's coming in and they've been focused on pushing ethics reform, but now that they have the power to push that ethics reform, what will they do? And I think the good news is that the legislation needed to close all those doors and those gaps that you mentioned exists. There are plenty of pieces of legislation that lay out quick, uh, uh, clearly uh, what needs to change and how it needs to change. But the question is, will it remain a priority for uh, the new Congress? And the role of Congress is to keep it a priority. We have no idea what is on the other side of this pandemic once it is in control, and uh, we hope that comes soon, because there can be many unexpected uh, events that happen that could draw Congress's attention away from this ethics reform. But the hope and the, the uh, goal for all those ethics uh, good government groups that have been waiting for this moment is that Congress will not lose sight of the uh, reform that they've been championing uh, for quite some time. What do you see as kind of the most important priorities for the Biden administration in order to kind of realign and, and repair the damage that's been done um, in the Trump administration to ethics? Well, I think you touched right on a key part, which is that the Biden administration will have to deal with the appearance that there may be conflicts of interest. And the only way to counter that appearance is to show a true commitment to reforming ethics, which is part of their campaign pledge. So I think there are a few things that the Biden administration can do on day one, especially in the first 100 days, to show that there is a commitment in light of the allegations that there may be an appearance of other conflicts. And first, I think that they should appoint a chief uh, administrative officer who is in charge of uh, implementing the ethics agenda. So clearly, Biden laid out in his campaign that he has this ethics agenda. Well, who's in charge of it? If there can be someone appointed to that within the White House, that shows there is a commitment to get something done. Second, there should be a lobbying reform task force. That can get at the heart of all of the allegations of revolving door problems or ties to special interests by showing a commitment to changing the laws that would govern that type of activity. And then I think finally, that should be a real push for the creation of the Commission on Federal Ethics one of the most promising and um, uh, ambitious goals stated in Biden's campaign is the creation of this Commission on Federal Ethics, which would have the jurisdiction of the Office of Government Ethics, the Federal Election Commission, and the uh, uh, Special Counsel's Office. This new agency could be a watershed moment in ethics. And if the Biden administration shows that they are committed to that, I think they can easily not only reform the damage that was done during the, during the Trump administration, but they can also show that they are committed to ethics. I agree. And I think, you know, in general, we're at a watershed moment for ethics, um, ethics and government, and particularly the federal government. Um, we know that reform follows crisis. And I think the last four years has been an ethics crisis. And I think you know, we're on the cusp of what can be, you know, really meaningful reform. And hopefully, you know, the, the people in charge take this seriously. And, you know, if they don't, we can work to hold them accountable and make sure that, you know, they're, they're keeping their promises to reform ethics and government. And I'm, I'm really optimistic that, that we're gonna see some real change in Washington in the coming, coming months and years. I agree. Hopefully. Well, Delaney, it was a pleasure talking to you. It was a pleasure talking to you too, Kedrick, as always.